rigorously fulfilling your duty to your family. So in my book, the whole chapter will likely be entitled Duty to Your Family. That is what she keeps saying. I have to take care of my mother. But there's something else she's not saying about the duty. The exertion, oops, I'm sorry, can you go back up? The exertion, you are undermining your health. He's very worried about her health. You're destroying your spirits. Towards your family, you're trembling alive to the fear of giving disappointment. Now, she can get married in her own right at 21. You don't have to have your parents' permission. Mm -hmm. um, at 21, she's already of that age. But um, she is very concerned of giving, uh, doing something that her parents wouldn't like. Now, her relationship with her mom is not the healthiest ever I have seen. I had, she says to George, I had not intended mentioning to my mother that I had received a letter until after I had answered it, but as I could not conceal my distress, she observed it and I was obliged to acknowledge the cause. I did not, however, show the letter to her as I feared you might think it a breach of confidence to do so without your release, but if you will allow me to be great satisfaction to me to read it to her as proof how truly deserving you were of the sincere affection I felt for you. Interestingly, George is a rule follower. He's a clergyman. He is not going to try to um, elope with her. It's going to be done out in the open. It's going to be done proper, and he's going to get that family's blessing. He never tries to take her to Gretna Green or anything up in Scotland. He never does anything like that. He's, he's like, let your mother see you. We need to be transparent in all things. He is very much staying within the boundaries of the cultural norms. And then Catherine says, Catherine to George, George said, everybody knows about our romance, that he's quite distressed about that. And she says, I do not believe that they, my family, have ever mentioned the subject, our romance, to anybody. I cannot say the same for myself, because just in two or three instances, circumstances have compelled me to be unreserved. But I don't think those in whom I confided would have betrayed me. Oh, yeah. Definitely not. The local vicar has fallen in love with the Earl of Suffolk's daughter, and this is a you know a really serious one. I'm sure nobody would repeat it. Yeah, I'm sure. And she's right. The interesting thing is there's stated reasons, and then when you do some more research on these people, you think, oh, there's some elephants in the room they don't mention in the letters. So let's think about that first. Beyond being the daughter of an earl, this earl desperately needs his two surviving offspring to make a brilliant marriage. A brilliant marriage. Why? Because he is sort of an accidental earl. He was born in Ireland. Nobody ever mentions that. That's, he was, at his birth, a very, very long way from being the earl. In fact, in the course of his lifetime, 30 plus men will die through a series of unfortunate events <laughs> to bring him to this earldom. He is the least likely person, it seems, to come to this inheritance. All kinds of things happen. We have several um, that are in line, that are, we have a, a Viscount Andover, that's the heir to the earldom, killed in a carriage accident. We have several sons of those earls that die without male issue. They have to have a male. We have a male uh, earl born posthumously. His father has just died a few months before. They hold the earldom in case it's a boy. It is a boy. He dies three days later. I mean, it is unbelievable what happens. This man, her father, and her uncle fought in the American Revolution. They came over to America. They fought, and his brother, who's older, is killed in the American Revolution. So he's in his 40s, he inherits it, and he's very poor. Because the last Earl, who he's distantly related to, has to give to him the title and the house and some of the property which is in tail mail. In tail. It's legally it has to go to the next male heir. But everything else that he doesn't legally have to give to him, he gives to his daughter named Diana. And she gets massive amounts of land and cash and those kind of things. So he is one of the poorest aristocrats around. He really needs her to go out and marry like into the Duke of Marlborough's family or something. You see what I'm saying? She's falling in love with a local vicar. <laughs> the second thing that's an elephant in the room is that there's a huge scandal 
in the Bissett family. Huge as in O.J. Simpson trial publicity. It's the biggest trial of the late 18th century, and it's with that oldest brother, Maurice, or Morris George II. So let's talk a little bit about that. There is a book out that you might want to buy. It's called Lady Worsley's Wind. It came out in 2008, and it talks all about this scandal. And um, it's an 18th century, very late 18th century, tale of sex, scandal, and divorce. And what happens is, on the Isle of Wight, there's a Lord Worsley who has a big estate. And it abuts the Bissett estate that the eldest brother has inherited. Maurice uh, George Bissett has inherited it. And Lord Worsley is in charge of the Isle of Wight militia. And one of his officers under him is Maurice George Bissett. And he falls in love with Lady Worsley. And they have a big love affair. They have a child and then later another child together. And they run off together. Okay. Lord Worsley sues Maurice George over this. And it was made into a television movie played in England. You can probably see the whole thing on YouTube if you wanted to look it up. And uh, this is from the BBC. It's about a 30 second trailer for this scandal. I am yours, sir, to do with as you please. I have many unspoken desires. You have my permission to. You ask too much of me, sir. Obey. My true love. There will be a trial, and I will prosecute. Why can I not tell the whole truth? I will never belong to any man. The true featuring story of the scandalous Lady W on BBC Two. So what's happening here? If you have an affair with a man's wife, particularly if he's an aristocrat because he can afford to go to court. He can sue you. It's not suing you for adultery. It has a very odd legal term. He sues you for criminal conversation. I'm not even making that up. Criminal <laughs> conversation. And um, then he says, you owe me this much money because it cost me this much damage. So it goes to trial. So let's a little, learn a little bit about the trial. Um, in the lawsuit, it says that George, they put George first, George Maurice Bissett, had made an assault on Seymour. That's her first name. Lady Worsley's first name is Seymour. She's the wife of the plaintiff, and then and there debauched her, deflowered her, lay with her, and carnally knew her. And this caused the plaintiff a damage of 20,000 pounds. Now, if, if Maurice George Bissett sold everything, including the estates from his family and the clothes off his back, he might be worth 10,000 pounds. So if, there's, he, if he loses this court case, he is ruined. But it's not just the financial risk. The whole world, England world, British world, knows about this. Why? It's a media circus. Here's a British Library pamphlet of local history from Aberdeenshire where um, his ultimate family seat is from. They don't, Morris to George doesn't inherit it, but like his ancestors are from there. Um, now if you go up to his grave, you'll never suspect that Maurice George Bissett once rang throughout England as a co-respondent in a notorious divorce case. One report of it ran through at least five editions of at least half a dozen skits, like theater, about the case were published in pamphlet form. There's several caricatures of this divorce case. And so he has an infamous name. The name of Maurice George Bissett is that, and everybody seems to know the whole name, Maurice George. George, it rang through England, and he's a notorious man. I cannot believe the publicity on this. It's just unbelievable. And so started digging around in the British Library to find evidence of this being published around London. And what's happening is that there's a lot of newspaper men uh, taking shorthand every day in the trial and running out to the publishers and putting it on the printing press and selling them the next day. So this is from the British Library Archives. This is just one day of the, of the, of the trial. And you can see Sir Richard Worsley, they put George first, and George first. That's not going to help our George, is it? George Maurice or Morris Bissett. Criminal conversation is just from one day. So they're printing these pamphlets and selling them on the streets of London. 
and every day in the newspaper, it's not just a little summary, it's columns and columns about what's happened. In, because why is it such a big deal? Well, I'll tell you that in a second, but this is a, a 21st century scholarly article about this affair. Because there's a lot of interest in divorce and criminal conversation in the scholarly literature. And um, Cindy McCreary writes about it. But the most interesting thing to me is the first footnote. The first footnote, she says, the defendant's name was variously recorded as George uh, Maurice or Maurice George Visit. But I decided I'll use George Maurice Visit. Do you see how that doesn't help George? It would be like if O.J. Simpson's our most famous trial, it would be like being the younger brother of O.J. Simpson and you say, hi, I'm J.O. Simpson. You see what I'm saying? There's too much associated with the scandal, particularly the name. Now, Lady Worsley is a beautiful woman. She is known to have made this uh, design this outfit herself. This is her husband in his Hampshire, the Isle of Wight is in Hampshire, uh, the Hampshire Regiment uh, uniform, and she makes a dress that looks very similar to that. She's quite a beauty. And uh, these are the characters. What's going on here? He, every man that comes to his house on the Isle of Wight, he invites to peek at his wife. Dressing, bathing, if he's making love to his wife, he apparently gets turned on by people being lawyerists at him. So that's why they're peeking through the... And over 30 men testify at the trial that when they were invited to the house, he let them, encourage them, ask them to come and look at his wife. That's why, you know, sex sells, right? It sells the newspapers. <laughs> and so these are caricatures of all these people, many of them high ranking. What is Maurice George's defense? Listen to this. The loss of your wife is not worth much. Now, women aren't allowed in trial. She couldn't testify. He says, the licentious conduct of Lady Worsley was so notorious that many ladies of distinction had frequently remonstrated with Sir Richard Worsley and had told him if he did not attempt to refrain her conduct, her character would be ruined and destroyed. So the argument is that her character is already ruined, right? She's not worth much. And Sir Richard's answer was that Lady Worsley liked it and he was not going to stop this behavior. He's the one encouraging the behavior. Now, if we look at Pride and Prejudice, we realize that any impropriety in one's family will definitely hurt your chances at marriage. Yeah? Do you remember? Lizzie Bennet is so embarrassed just when her mother is just silly and giggly and imprudent in her talk. And then when her youngest sister has to elope or he, she runs off without being married, um, and, and how that is going to hurt all of their chances for a good marriage, because everyone will vote. And so Jane Austen writes, when Lizzie came to the part of the letter in which her family were mentioned in such mortifying terms, yet the family merited this reproach. Her sense of shame was severe. Remember how terribly upset she is. She realizes this will ruin her chances uh, to get married to Mr. Darcy. So. These are the, some of the things, the reasons they, they're not really allowed to marry at first, yeah? Uh, that's just too fresh in 1802. That scandal is fresh. She's, this is their only other marriage prospect is this daughter, and her mother really wants to hold on to her. So then in 1811, the second attempt is made to get her to marry him. And so the first thing is that George starts to write these letters that say, I am about to go on a big mission trip. I'll probably be there the rest of my life. And I'm gonna go to Ceylon, which is modern day Sri Lanka. Because my brand new brother-in-law, Sophia, my lovely sister, she's married a widower who's General Robert Brownrigg, and he's just been appointed the governor of that island. And I'm going there to run the missionary program for him. So I really don't wanna go, you wanna get married? <laughs> and she says, Oh, those are the worst and most heart-wrenching letters back and forth. I mean, she just doesn't say no. She says, you know, I'll esteem you the rest of my life. Blah, 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 blah. She really is crazy about it, but she says no. So George gets on a boat, and he sails <coughs> from England. And if you click, it'll start up going. Sails from England, and he stops at the British port of St. Helena. Then he goes down to the Cape, and then, because there, and then goes all the way. This is Sri Lanka, Ceylon. 
right off the coast of India. They cannot go, like modern day, we would go right there through the Suez Canal, but it is not built yet. It will be a couple of decades before it's built. So you have to go all the way around to get there. Okay. And while he's there, he's there, for, he leaves in 1811, takes about four to five months to get there. It's a sail for four to five months. Gets there in 1812, he stays till 1820. He's the colonial chaplain, he's the private secretary to his brother-in-law, who is the absolute ruler of this place, okay? General Brown. And St. Lon is a very exotic place, it's very hot. Um, they do not make tea yet. They produce no tea yet in Ceylon, just cinnamon and that kind of thing. And this summer, um, we went to Broughton Castle. We were in, uh, in England, back in England. And went there because George, while he was there, worked virtually every day with a guy named Twizzleton. Twizzleton visit, Twizzleton visit in other records, not in the love letters, but in other records we keep seeing. And one day, I realized, one day, one time, it was listed as the Honorable Twizzleton. Whoa, it is the Honorable, his father has to be a Lord, a Baron. What family is the Twizzleton family? I don't even know. Because they've changed their name. It's three times hyphenated today, and it's the Fines family today. As in the actors, the Fine brothers. This is current Lord Say and Seal's nephews. Anyway, it's the seat of Lord Sayin. So the castle has stood since about 1377. And uh, when we went there on an open day, um, which a lot of aristocrats do, they have open days a few days a year because it decreases their death duties if they've opened it to the public. So went to talk to the heir of uh, Lord Sayin Seal. And uh, Lord Sayin Seal is in his 90s, so the heir was there and asking, Martin, uh, Martin Fines is his name, any chance you have any documents? And he said, by the way, we do. We do. We just finished organizing our documents. Mm -hmm. Really? Is there any chance? Because ancestor Thomas James Twizzleton worked with a guy named Reverend Bissett, and your ancestor, he can fill in the blank. Oh, yeah, he was Archdeacon of Ceylon. That's right. He works with the guy I'm working on a book at every day. Any chance I could see if you have any letters from him? And 10 minutes later, upstairs in this massive study of his, this archivist there, she's just done this fabulous job of putting these documents together. I mean, 10 minutes from coming up with that sentence to him, we had letters from Ceylon. And took photographs, and uh, here I am inside the castle, you can kind of see the gate house, reading through letters, get some good photographs of the Broughton Castle letters, and sure enough, uh, Bissett is mentioned in it. To get a little bit more information about Vincent, Bissett. They know each other. My old acquaintance, Bissett, they actually went to school together at Westminster School. Uh, look, he is gray-headed, wrinkled, and out of health. I love that. He's not Mr. Darcy, is he? But he's desperately in love with her, and he's really run away to try to get away from the pain of her rejection. And so he does a lot, and he's mentioned, Bissett is mentioned maybe six, seven times in these letters. Now, just as a footnote, just an interesting footnote, the Twizzleton's sister, okay? So we've got hundreds of letters in this archive. And after a while, we're looking at all these letters. Sometimes Twizzleton is writing to his sister. Sometimes his sister's writing to him, and these letters are preserved. The sister is named Mrs. Julia Lee. And sometimes she's at Adelstock, Gloucestershire, and sometimes she's at Stoneleigh, Warwickshire. If you're a Jane Austen addict, Maybe like I am. Whoa! She, she's his sister's married Jane Austen's cousin. His sister has married Jane Austen's cousin, and so we're very excited about that. Starting to tra try to transcribe those at the same time as trying to get the visit love letters out. But that is nobody's ever seen these letters before, and this is really exciting. Um, so far, I don't have an ex a direct Jane Austen reference. Um, I have one I think is one uh, about, it's written a reference about having good writers in your family the same year she first publishes. Um, but anyway, there's lots of excitement about this because in Jane Austen's life, any biography of Jane Austen, there will be a, a chapter perhaps on this event in her family's life of who will inherit Stoneleigh Abbey. And, and she's married to the guy who inherits it. 
Okay, so this is just a gold line for us. Okay, but anyway, um, George and Catherine write back and forth. It takes six months to get a letter delivered. So when you write to Catherine, she'll read it six months later. If she replies that day, it'll be a year before he gets a reply. But he is heartbroken. And he's saying, you know, I came here, I tried to get you out of my mind, accept the fact. And he, uh, and uh, he says, I'm just, I'm just, I want to tell you I love you, and they're heart-wrenching and everything, right? And uh, she replies, and while he's there, he does crazy things, and I could go on for hours about this. He, there's a whole bunch that can be written about his time in Ceylon, but the funniest thing he does is he's real determined to convert not only the Buddhist and the Hindu, but he's, con he's determined to convert the Catholics. So one day he dresses up like a Catholic priest, and he, and he acts like a Catholic priest for a couple of days. Uh, because the Portuguese used to be controlling the island. They had a lot of Catholics there. And he's handing out the very new, he's been working on this with a team of Wesleyan missionaries, the new transcription of the Bible. That'll be the Protestant Bible, right? In the native language. He's very excited about that. And he acts like he is the Catholic priest, except he never mentions the Virgin Mary, and he never actually holds mass, which makes him a little suspicious, right? They, they catch him. And they start throwing rocks at him, and he has to jump out the window and run into the jungle and stuff. But anyway, he is pretty powerful because his, uh, his uh, brother is the uh, governor. And so George had been writing these letters to Catherine, and then she changes her mind. She changes her mind. He's, all, he's halfway around the world. And so he finally writes back. The first impulse, which I felt on reading your letter, was to sail to England by the first ship. But I'm not coming. Yeah, I'm not coming back. Uh, you've been you've been very wishy-washy, all right? And I I think by the time I get back, you'll have changed your mind again. So here's a summary of, of Lady Catherine's feelings. She was persuaded to believe that the engagement was a wrong thing, indiscreet, improper, hardly capable of success, and not deserving it. But it was not merely selfish caution under which she acted in putting an end to it. Had she not imagined herself consulting his good, and that's a lot in the letters, she's always like, this is for your good that I don't marry you. Um, even more than her own, she could hardly have given him up. The belief of being prudent and self-denying, principally for his advantage, was her chief consultation. Under the misery of a parting, a final parting, and every consolation was required, for she had to encounter the additional pain of opinions on his side, totally unconvinced and unbending, of his feelings himself, so he used to used by so forced a relinquishment, he had left the country in consequence. I'm lying to you. This is Jane Austen's persuasion. Jane Austen writes persuasion in, from 1815 till 1816. It's a year and a day that she writes it, and I'm thoroughly convinced she knew about this. She could have known about it from the Bissett, Bissett Twizzleton connection, and I have 49 other files of connections between them. And persuasion is about a romance, an engagement, an engagement broken, the family being opposed, the woman having the higher rank, the man going overseas, um, and returning, and then they marry. And I don't have to tell you about this, but there's a civil war that he's. Uh, involved in, I mean, it is a fight, but his brother-in-law has to conquer the entire island. The last native kingdom is there. And uh, that's a, a lecture for another day, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But his family status is rising. Things are going better for his family. Maurice is just about to die. His brother is an archdeacon in Ireland. He's just about to be the bishop in Ireland. Uh, Sophia has become Lady Sophie. She's, uh, General Brownrigg got a baronetcy out of this. He becomes Sir General Brownrigg. If your husband is a sir, you're a lady. Do you see how things are going a little bit better? His, uh, this is uh, uh, his brother, George, who will become the Bishop of Rafo very quickly. And so he then, letters go back and forth. That's okay. And you can see it takes him a long time. And eventually, to make a long story short, um, he then comes back to England. He's getting quite old. Um, this is her brother, his brother-in-law, General Brownrigg, his sister, Lady Brownrigg, and then his brother is just about to be the Bishop of Rafo. Uh, my research assistant and I we went through this ruins of this castle. That's where he lived. Yeah, his, oh, his brother George <coughs> lived there. 
And so George comes back to England. And of course, it's four and a half months back in a ship. And um, we'll see that it just goes back in reverse. Let's see if this slide works very well. Sometimes I have slides. OK. You can see they go from Ceylon. And they stop the Cape for a while. And then he goes to St. Helena. And he writes a letter from St. Helena. And I'm like, I'm going to be famous. Do you know who lives on St. Helena in 1820? Napoleon. Napoleon. Yeah. <laughs> what is there to do? There is nothing on this island to do except go interview Napoleon. Right? Does he do it? No. So I'm not really famous. And the, but what he does notice, he reads the British newspapers. This is a British port. He reads the British newspapers and says, oh my gosh, the Earl of Suffolk is dead. And he writes this letter to her. I'm going to say, Helena, I'm sure I'll be home before the letter even gets home. I'm so desperately sorry. I hope your mother's OK. I'll be home in such and such time. Gets home all the way back to England. And they get married. Seventeen and a half years. Her mother's actually already dead. He didn't know it. They just died up two months apart. And they get married in uh, 1820. This marriage will last about eight years because George is going to die. I don't know. And here's the town of Malmesbury. They married within walking distance of the Abbey at a little place called Westport. And I gave a speech at Malmesbury in July and um, to their historical site. They were so thrilled with it. Somebody had the key to the old Westport church where they married and, and took me down there to see it. Which I was but that's what it used to look like when they married there. And uh, this is what it looks like today. It's no longer a church. It's a daycare and family center. But I got to go in. And then a few years ago, I bought this portrait. I'm convinced it's her. And then I can tell you, it takes about 30 minutes to explain why it's her. I studied it a long time. It's a miniature. It's about this big. But you can't see that she has a wedding ring on. She's in half the morning. We know that she wore black into her wedding. She's grieving for her parents who were just recently deceased. It's done in the right year at the right address, and the Bissette love letters mention who does it, a Mr. Bone, and gives the, it's a mile and a third from his hotel, and Mr. Bone is a mile and a third from the hotel by Google Maps, and like, this has got to be it. So I think this is her when she marries, and this is the marriage license. And uh, you can see Lady Catherine Howard, she's a spinster from Charlton's, and the Reverend George Bissett, a clergyman. And look, John Lovell, that's my name. A guy named Lovell married them. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and then um, here's their, there's their uh, signatures. And look, one of the witnesses is 007. What is that? James, James Bond. Bond. <laughs> <laughs> and James Bond is witnessing all these weddings. Uh, you know, in the parish records, in somebody in Malmesbury said, oh, he was the butcher right across the street from that church, and they need a witness, they go get the butcher. <laughs> and this lady is really going to be famous in my other research project, Baron Tinsky. I've got a Russian princess that goes insane that's raised in Sherborn House in my village, and she's the governess for them. And the, the countess signs, but the earl does not sign. He seems to have always been in favor of this marriage. Where is the earl? You know where the Earl is? The Earl is in the trial for the Queen. The Queen is on trial for adultery, and the King will find you a member, a peer, peer of the realm. I think something like 160 pounds a day if you miss the trial. Okay, so you couldn't be there for it. Yeah, that took some research. Like, what's going on simultaneously okay. if, you would, if you miss that? And so I probably better stop a little bit for questions now, but this could go on and on. That's just the beginning of it.